The scripture reading for this evening is found in 1 Peter 1, verse 17 through 21. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the fruitile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And so it's really good to see you guys here. Um, and, and I, I want to just mention uh, some, some friends of ours who have actually not just here for a visit, but they've, moved, they've uprooted their lives and they've moved to the city for the sole purpose of helping us plant a church. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Stephen Chung. I'm, I'm the resident uh, church planter here. And these friends have moved with us uh, just a couple of weeks ago to, to help us plant a church up in Morningside Heights, West Harlem area. Uh, Stuart and Bethany, would you just stand up for a moment? I know, Bethany, you're on crutches, so it might be a bit hard at the moment, but... Uh, Guys, give them a warm welcome. Um, Stuart's been an elder at our, our previous church for many, many years, and they're just a great, great couple, so please uh, introduce yourselves to them, get, get to know them. Uh, I feel it's kind of a real privilege that they, they would do that for us. Um, and and good, good news for those of you who are parents, they are both pediatricians, okay? So every Sunday night we'll have free checkups for your kids. And, and, and the good thing is, if you, if you don't like what Stuart says, you can always go to Bethany for a second opinion, so that's, that's good. Okay, let's, let's uh, just stop for a moment and uh, pray. So, Father, as, as we come and we think once again about holiness, and, and we just read these words, these ink marks on paper, we pray that they, they won't just remain ink marks on paper, but they would be, they would be life to us, and that these words would grip our hearts, story our lives, and change the way we live. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so, one translation talks about us being exiles. Um, other translations talk about us being foreigners. Here, this translation says this, since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Exiles, foreigners. This isn't the only place, he says. It's later on in this book. He talks about us being foreigners or aliens and strangers on the earth. Exiles, foreigners, aliens, and strangers. This, this is a rather unusual proposal that, that uh, Peter gives us here. I mean, think about what he's saying. He's saying, live your lives as foreigners. Live your lives as foreigners. Just think about what that means. Just, just for a moment, let that, that sink in. Live your lives as foreigners. Of course, uh, if we, I think that's a really interesting idea. If, if we're going to live our lives, and I think live is a pretty big word there, isn't it? Because it's kind of like taking you take your whole life, point it, and live it in this direction, right? So imagine if we're going to live that way, if we're going to live as foreigners, first of all, we're, we're going to have to think like foreigners. And if we're going to think like a foreigner, we're, we're going to have to kind of be comfortable identifying as a foreigner, first of all. You just, you just got to be comfortable saying, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm a foreigner. This is, you've got to be comfortable in the first place seeing yourself that way. Live your lives as exiles or aliens and strangers or foreigners here in reverent fear. I, I think this is something that as, as Brits, and I, and I think this is true of Americans too, for so any Brits and Americans here this, this, uh, this evening, I, just, this is, I think we share this, this problem, this issue, right? It's actually quite difficult for us to see ourselves as foreigners, even when we are foreigners, right? I think it has something to do with, with British Empire and American Empire or superpower or whatever you want to call it, right? There's something about that experience of empire and superpower that tends to make us see everyone else as foreigners, even when we're in someone else's country. Right? And you see, when we're overseas, right, we're not foreigners, right? We're, we're, we're expats, right? We're, we're part of the expat community. That's the way we identify. But no, no, Peter doesn't say that. He says, see yourselves as 
foreigners. Uh, think of yourself as a foreigner, think like a foreigner, so you can live like a foreigner. Well, I, I thought it would be helpful if we spent the first few minutes this evening just up front here, just trying to connect, just trying to connect with the foreign experience. Let's just spend a, a few minutes here reflecting on what it's like to be a foreigner. What's it like to be a foreigner? Now, I know some of you have, have, have maybe just moved to the city fairly recently. Some of you are just visiting, and New York may seem like a very foreign place, right? It may seem like a very foreign land. But, but I, on the other hand, I think that the experience, the foreign experience is somewhat neutralized in a place like this, but the fact that every other person you talk to is from somewhere else, right? It, it's like that in London as well, but very similar in, in, in that re regard. No, I think the kind of foreign that, that Peter's after here is, is the kind of foreign where you couldn't hide it if you wanted to. Sometimes you stand out even when you don't want to. I think that's the kind of foreign that Peter's after. That's the kind of foreign he's after. Now, I'm not an, I'm not an expert, right? I'm not an expert in this, but I do have some experience at, at this because one way or another, one way or another, I have been a foreigner all my life. I, mean, I didn't plan it that way. It just kind of happened to me, right? Um, as, as many of you know, uh, I'm, I'm British, but, but I'm not actually English, right? Um, with a name like Chern, right? Who'd have guessed, right? I'm, I'm half Armenian, quarter Korean, quarter Chinese, which I, I think I may have shared before. But I, I spent the first eight or nine years of my life living in this little seaside town in the southeast of England called Worthing. It's a very all-white kind of Anglo sort of town. And I was one of the few foreign-looking kids, me and my brother, and maybe one or two others, who were the foreign-looking kids in school. So inevitably, I received quite a bit of racism. Now, if I'd been living in London or, or near London, it would have been a completely different story. But hey, it was the late 70s, early 80s in a place, town like that. Things weren't going to go well for me, right? They just, they just weren't. So I was called every racist name you can think of. Packy, Chinky, Wog, Wop, the N-word. I mean, every, seriously, every racist name you can think of. Because you see, these kids were smart, right? Because they weren't actually sure what I was. They didn't know what was, so they just, you know, they just made sure they covered all their bases, right? This is, this is what they did. They're smart kids. Um, so sometimes being a foreigner is like that. You just look different, and you can't hide it even if you want to. You couldn't hide it if you tried. Live your lives as foreigners here. I want us to connect for a moment with the foreign experience. What's it like to be a foreigner? Um, uh, Sometimes it's not the way you look, it's the things you do that just make you, it's obvious, you're, you're foreign. Uh, I remember back in, uh, this is again back in Britain, we, we had a problem with our car. I was pastoring this church at the time, so we took our car into this mechanic at, uh, from our church. And within about two minutes, he fixes it, takes a fuse out, replaces it, done. Right? And, and so I pull out my wallet, and the smallest denomination I've got in there is a 20 pound note, that's about 40 bucks back then. I'm thinking, I hope he doesn't take the whole lot because I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, we were broke at the time, as we say in England, we were skint, right? So I, so I, I bring out my, my 20 pound note, I, I offer it to him, and he goes, oh, no, 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 that's okay, you don't have to pay, right? And I said, well, I want to pay you something. And he goes, oh, all right then, and he takes it. And I'm like, as, as an Asian, right, someone who's been influenced by Asian culture, that is not how that was meant to go down, okay? Here's, this is how it was meant to happen, okay? I was meant to offer him the money, and he was meant to refuse it. Then I was going to offer it again, and he was going to refuse it again. Then I was going to offer it again, and he was going to... Re and he, I was meant to be able to offer this at least three, four, maybe five times before he knew I was for real, that I was being serious, and then he could take my money. My wife, being English, of course, she turns to me later on, and she goes, huh, well, that would teach you to say things you don't really mean. But, but it's... This is, um, it's the Asian way, right? This is just the way we, we do it. Sometimes when you're foreign, it's like you're living by the laws of another land, by the, by the conventions and customs of some place else. Live your lives as foreigners here, as aliens and strangers here, as exiles here. Live your lives as foreigners here in reverent fear. What's it like to be foreign? I just want us to connect for a moment. One, one more example of, what, of just connect with that ex foreign experience. Sometimes it's the way you speak, isn't it? It just makes it obvious that you're a foreigner. Um, so when I was very young, my mum was teaching me Armenian, and she stopped teaching me Armenian. And, and you'll, you'll appreciate the irony here. The reason she stopped teaching me Armenian is because she was afraid I was going to grow up with an accent, right? So, you know, I've spent most of my adult life here. You know, guess what? So, so I've been asked all sorts of questions about accent and language since I've lived in America? R really great questions. And I, here, here are a few of my favorite. 
Um, what language do you speak in England? No, no, really, that, seriously. What, do you like our, do, do you find our language difficult? To, to which I always respond, yes, very, very difficult. Um, why do you all say things differently over there? To which, to which I reply, well, no, surely the, the question is, why do you say things differently over here? To which I, I, I actually got a blank look. Um, and my all-time favorite is, is your accent genetic? I, lo I love that. They, they, now, they actually didn't ask it quite like that. What they asked was, if you had kids and they grew up and they never heard you speaking, would they still have an accent? To, to which I replied, are you asking me if my accent's genetic? Um, and and uh, in, all, in, look, in all fairness, his friend actually knew they'd just said something really dumb as soon as the words came out of her mouth. But it was too late, and I love to use it against her. But, but it's just like, you know, live your lives as foreigners here. This is what Peter says. Live your lives as foreigners, as aliens and strangers here in reverent fear. And so what we've been doing here is just trying to reflect for a moment on what it's like to be a foreigner. And actually what we've been doing, as we've been doing that, is really what we've been doing is reflecting on a very important facet of what it's like to be holy. You see, Peter has been calling us to his holy life, and, and he's, as we've been trying to connect with the foreign experience, what Peter's hoping is that we're actually connecting with the experience of being holy. In the previous verses, for those of you who were here last week, Peter says, Therefore, just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all that you do, for it is written, Be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. How, how many times can he fit holy into that phrase, right, into that sentence? This is call to the holy life. But, but then he starts thinking it through, and he says, Well, what does this look like? What does it look like to be holy? And the first thing that comes to mind, the first descriptor he gives us is, Well, being holy is kind of like being foreign. Being holy is kind of like being a foreigner. You look different, you sound different, you act in very, very different ways at times. Sometimes when you are holy, it's as if you're living by the laws of another land, the customs and conventions of someplace else. Sometimes when you're holy, what it's like is you're, you're speaking this other language. You've got this, not just an accent, but this grammar, a entirely different grammar that betrays an entirely different way of looking at the world. And, and so... Peter says, look, you, you're just different. You're different. Now, I, I just want to clarify something here. There, there, there are some translation issues. Did you remember last week there were some translation issues which I tried to clear up? And uh, for those of you here, we talked about how, where it says, therefore, just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all that you do. Some people think that means, therefore, just as he who called you is irrelevant and otherworldly, be relevant and otherworldly in all that you do. And, and where it says, therefore, be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord, some people translate that as, therefore, be boring, for I am boring, says the Lord, right? That translation issues, it's a bad translation. The, the similar thing going on here this week as well in, in this passage. Some people translate this as, therefore, live your lives here as weirdos in reverent fear, right? Some, some people translate it that. That's a bad translation. If that's what it says in your Bible, live your lives as weirdos here in reverent fear. Weirdo and different are not the same thing. Sometimes we get those mixed up, right? That there's different and then there's different, right? There's a good different and there's a not so, there's different types of different, right? Does, does that make sense? So I, I love the way that Francis Chan puts it. So Francis Chan says this. He, he, he says, look, don't be the guy who gets invited out to lunch by your workmates, by your colleagues, right, or gets invited to happy hour by your colleagues, and you go, oh, it, it's all right, I'm, I'm going to stay behind and listen to my podcast. Right? Oh, what, what are you listening to? Oh, it's a debate amongst my favorite reform thinkers about who's more reformed than who and who's not reformed enough. Thanks, right? And the next day they say, hey, come, come join us for lunch. And you're like, oh, no, no, I'm going to listen to my Matt Chandler sermon, right? Put your Chandler away and go with them, right? Ah, oh, but we've got to be different. We've got to be different. Yeah, but not like that, right? We, that's, the, that's the wrong kind of different. That's just weird, right? So, so we're called to be different. I've got a, a friend here. I've got a friend here in the, in the city who is uh, working... Um, uh, uh, to, to become a tax attorney. He's got experience in accounting, experience in, in law. And he actually applied to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, for an internship. Now, uh, by the time he applied for this, the positions were filled, there wasn't any room for him. And, you know, it was a long shot. It's a pretty prestigious type of role to, to get. 
It was unlikely. It was a long shot. So he didn't get it. But he's pretty tenacious. And, and he goes after it. And he reaches out to someone anyway at the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And he, and he starts to describe to them the, what he wanted to do with this internship at the IMF, the research that he wanted to pursue. And, and he, the way my friend spoke to this, this guy at the IMF was so foreign, it, it was just so different, but, but different in a good way, not different weird, right? It was different in a good way. It, it was like he was living by the laws of another land, the conventions and customs of somewhere else. It, it, it was like he was speaking another language, had a, had a grammar that betrayed an entirely different way of seeing the world. And, and it was so different that, that this, this guy at the IMF creates an internship for him that didn't exist before, especially for him. So what was it my friend was telling him that was so different? He said, well, what I want to do is I want to research ways that we can use tax law to go after human traffickers and take their money away from them. I'm going to use tax law to go after human traffickers and take their money away from them and put those people away. Now, my friend could have been all about advancing his career, right? He's got a Park Avenue law firm on his resume. He's being headhunted. He could be all about, okay, I'm going to get on to the next rung. I'm going, to get, I'm going to climb that ladder. I'm going to get onto the next rung. He could be all about that. Everyone around him is about that. But you see, he's not like everyone else around him. He, no, 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 he's a foreigner. He, you, you talk to him, he's, he's very happy. He's saying, yeah, identifying that way. I'm, I'm a foreigner. And I think like a foreigner. And I live my life like a foreigner. Surely that's the kind of foreign we want to be, as, as opposed to the guy who's sticking his earbuds back in, right? right that's, that's the kind of foreign we want to be, the kind of different we want to be. By the, by the way, this, this is one of, one of the very first, just one more connection here with the foreign experience. This is one of the very first things that a foreigner has to deal with when they first land in a new country, in a foreign country, their host nation. The first thing they've got to decide is where are they going to live. When my grandfather arrived in England for the first time, he saw a poster in, uh, in Waterloo Station, and it said, come to sunny Worthing. That there's nowhere sunny in England, so complete nonsense, but he, he saw that, he thought, well, come to sunny Worthing, that looks nice, I'll go there. Now, what he could have done instead is he could have found an enclave of Armenians. There's, there's a large Armenian community on the way in to Ealing, and he could have set up shop there, got to know people, um, and, and people who looked like him, sounded like him, spoke like him, had the same customs as him, and he wouldn't have stood out as a foreigner. This is, but instead, he goes and lives in sunny, racist Worthing. No, it's not racist. They're very, 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 Worthing's actually a very nice town. They're very nice people. But this is, this, we've got that decision to make. Are we going to withdraw from culture to live in an enclave? or live in an enclave, right? A Christian ghetto. Or, or do, do we actually engage with the culture, contribute to the culture, bless the culture, but at the same time, always knowing, always knowing that we are very, very different from the culture because there's no two ways about it. We're foreigners. We're, we're foreigners. We, we think like foreigners. We live. We live like foreigners. Okay, I, I want to uh, draw a line under, under that now, um, and I want to move to the, the second part of, of what I want to say tonight. So for those of you, as I said last week, I, I'd like to give you a space here to, to jump back in if you checked out already, okay? So, so come back to us, and I, I want to, this is part two now, okay? This is your opportunity to join us again. Um, so one of the things I love about the biblical authors is they never just come along and say, hey, you do this, do that, do the other. They don't do that. They don't, do they don't just come along and, and, and say, here's a list of instructions, or here's a list of commands, go do this, without, first of all, giving you a kind of theological framework, a narrative framework in which those instructions make sense, in which those commandments become compelling. You just kind of feel, when they tell you the story, you feel compelled to live that way anyway. And Peter's no different. Peter's no different. Pe Peter doesn't just come along and say, hey, you live like a foreigner. Yeah, identify as a foreigner, think like a foreigner, live like a foreigner, that's it. No, he says, yeah, live like a foreigner, but here's why. Here's why you would live like a foreigner. So I'm going to read you what he says. He says, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. As it turns out, the very grounds on which he, which he, the very reason, he says, live like a foreigner, and then he gives the reason for being foreign, 
but the very reason he gives us for living like a foreigner is itself a foreign concept. <laughs> That's ironic, isn't it? He says, live like a foreigner, and here's why, and, and the, the, the reason why is a very foreign idea. Now, if, if you've been in church your whole life, or you've been in church a good long time, this may not sound very foreign. Some of you who have been a, maybe not been part of church ever, or, or only recently been part of church, this, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? So, so I want us to just, uh, just listen to the language again. Listen, listen carefully, right? Blood, lamb, defect, blemish. This is a very strange vocabulary which, which, references, which references an ancient sacrificial system. And it seems that what Peter is doing is he's taking this ancient sacrificial system, he's superimposing it, right, onto the execution of a particular individual under Rome, so that he can then go and reinterpret that execution of that individual, right, as if it were some sort of human sacrifice on our behalf. You see, sometimes we get so used to this language, it just gets past us, we just escape, we don't even hear it, right, half the time, it doesn't, we don't bat an eyelid, it washes over us and we don't even give it a second thought. So, so the first thing I want us to do is to just hear, I want us to hear Peter's foreign accent. How about, let's put it that way. I want us to hear Peter's foreign accent. I, I, I want us to, to hear the, the strange vocabulary, the strange grammar that Peter's using that betrays an entirely different way of seeing. Uh, what I want to do is read you a, a, a short passage from a true story, an event that took place in the jungles of Irian Jaya in Papua New Guinea um, in the 1960s. And this is a story about how this particular tribe in, in the jungle dealt with their sin. Okay, and this again, this took place in Irian Jaya in the jungles in the 1960s. Nindik's uncle set her carefully on the point of a rocky ledge leaning over the channel. She threw her arm around Deku's leg to steady herself above the dizzying slipstream. If you were not here with me, she confided, I would feel very afraid. She gazed up with soulful eyes at her anguished uncles. Deku and Silan looked at each other and horror flooded their hearts as they realized it was time to do it. Almost uncontrollable impulses surged within Selan, while the rational impulses to snatch up his niece and flee to some corner of the world, but they would be hunted down. There was no escape. Selan glanced up at the mountainside they had descended. Every bush and rock seemed full of eyes, watching sternly lest they fail. He looked again in desperation at Deku, who said evenly, set your will, my brother. Then Deku's eyes flared with purpose, and he hissed, now. Simultaneously, they bent and lifted Nindik by her wrists and ankles. They heard her gasp as they swung her back, and as the forward motion began, she screamed, Oh, my fathers! They hurled her with all the force their trembling limbs could summon. She cartwheeled a tiny, spread, eagle figure and vanished with a little splash, scarcely noticeable in the churning rapids. The price had been paid. The sacrifice had been made. Sacrifice human sacrifice, blood, lamb, atonement, death, blemish, defect, the idea that we can avert the wrath of some deity by redirecting it onto some innocent third party, some innocent third person. What primitive Stone Age backward ideas are these? Do, do those words, do, isn't that what comes to, what Stone Age primitive backward ideas are these. Is this really what Peter's saying? Is this what, so Peter says, live like a foreigner. So we spend a bit of time at the front trying to connect with the foreign experience so we know what that means, so we can go after what Peter wants us to get after. Then he says, and here's why. And this is what he has to offer us? This is the rationale? This is the theological reason? Is this really what Peter's saying? It certainly seems to be what a lot of people hear Peter saying. This, this is why, uh, and this is why many people, even in recent years, have pointed to the, precisely this area of Christian theology, and have said, "Hey, this this is cosmic child abuse. This is cosmic child abuse. This is God's son on the cross. What's the difference between Jesus on the cross and, and this little girl being thrown off into the into the waterfall? What's the difference? Well, there is a difference, 
And, and it's a difference that makes all the difference in the world. Okay. In the case of Nindic, the little girl who's thrown into the waterfall, she is clearly a third person, a third party, an innocent third party being thrown off. Clearly, she's a third party, no doubts about that. In the case of Jesus on the cross, there is no third party. It's a little bit more complicated. There is no third party. You see, not according to Christian theology, according to Christian theology, God himself has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. God himself has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ, so when we see Jesus on the cross, this is not God sacrificing someone else. This is God sacrificing himself. God on the cross. This is the self-giving God, the God who gives himself for us. Hey, 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 I'm, I'm not asking you to believe this stuff. I, I just want to make sure we're getting the story straight. I just want to make sure we can glimpse the inner logic of this particular narrative, right? I, I remember sitting around with a group of friends who, most of them in that room that day were Christians. And they, they were just struggling with this whole idea of this sacrifice and the cross and the blood and the lamb and the blemish and the defect and all of this whole thing. They were just struggling with it. You know, I didn't ask him to do this. You know, did, 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 did he have to do this? Is this really necessary? All this. And it was actually the, the skeptic in the room, the, the, uh, the agnostic, who actually shed the most light on the whole conversation. And he said, no, well, wait, wait a second. He said, surely, surely, surely this is just what forgiveness always costs. This is just what forgiveness always costs. And the moment he said that, it just clicked for everyone in the room. If you don't know what he's on about, let, let, let me just ask you this question. Have you ever tried to forgive someone? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not talking about the, 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 the easy stuff, right? The, you know, oh, you ruined the movie for me, right? I was really looking forward to watching that movie. You told me the end. Thanks a lot. I've been looking forward to that all summer, you know. But I'm, I'm big enough, so I'm going to forgive you. Bless you, my child. Bless you, right? It's that kind of... I'm not talking about this, the little stuff, okay? I'm talking about the stuff that hurts you. I'm talking about stuff that wounds you, the stuff that keeps you up at night, the, the stuff that won't let you sleep, the stuff that makes you cry, the stuff that makes you angry, that makes you mad. Have you ever tried to forgive someone? If you have, sometimes you know what I'm talking about when I say sometimes it feels like you're going to die in the process. You're going to die in the process. Of sometimes it feels like you actually have to die to yourself in order to forgive them. Sometimes you would rather die than forgive them. You, you see, forgiveness is a very, very painful process. There was a lot of death and there's a lot of dying. There's a lot of death and there's a lot of dying involved. You see, what you're doing is you're essentially bearing the brunt of what someone else has done. And it's no good asking, hey, what, why doesn't this other person, when are they going to bear the brunt? No, no, that's the whole point. In forgiveness, you are bearing the brunt of what someone else has done. You're essentially substituting yourself for them. And so when we see Jesus on the cross, this is God saying, this is, me, this is what it costs me to forgive you. This is me bearing the brunt of what you have done. This is me substituting myself for you. Isn't this just what forgiveness always costs. Again, I'm not asking you to believe this stuff. I'm, I'm not even asking you to believe in something as outrageous as forgiveness. I, I'm just, let alone God, I just want to make sure that we're getting the story straight. Um, I've got a photo here of a, a dear friend. Some of you will know him. Could, could, could he put up the photo? Um, this is my friend Celestin Musakura. I've known him for about 20, 21 years now. This guy has had more impact on my life and, and, and than, than I can even begin to explain to you tonight. Um, so Celestin runs an organization called Alarm. It's called African Leadership and Reconciliation Ministries. And they spend a lot of time working in African, African countries, working with, with tribal reconciliation where there's been a lot of bloodshed and tribal conflict. And uh, they, they uh, do a lot of kind of um, training for, with lawyers and police force and civic leaders to, to anti-corruption training and training them to go after the, the criminals and the bad guys. And, um, and, and they also train a lot of pastors and, and church leaders as, as well. They do a lot of aid and relief work. I mean, it's, it's a great organization. And um, well, so when, when Celestin were, was very young, he, he became a Jesus follower, and the reaction of his family was to throw him out 
So for a couple of years, he was, he was thrown out of his house, and he was wandering the streets as a, as a kid, surviving. Uh, he, he said he had windows in his, in his shorts, which means he had you know, holes in his shorts. He was, just, he was, he was um, out there trying to def survive as a kid. Eventually, his parents become Jesus followers, and, and they call him home. And, and uh, there's this wonderful moment of reconciliation and restoration, and, and he finds it in his heart to forgive them for abandoning him, for chucking him out. Some years later, in the Rwandan genocide, uh, two million people, as you know, were, were slaughtered in that between the violence between the Hutus and the Tutsis, and members of his family, his parents and other relatives were, were killed in, the, in that conflict, in that violence. And he finds himself speaking to a crowd of pastors and church leaders, and he suddenly realizes that there were so many people in that group from the other tribe who had murdered so many people in his tribe and members of his family. And that night, he doesn't want to forgive them. He, he, resent, he wants to resent them. He wants to hate them. He wants to judge them. He wants to condemn them. He wants to pass sentence on them. Of course he does. Of course he does. But then he remembers this God who bears the brunt of what we have done, this God who, who, who substitutes himself for us. And, and he says, God, this is crazy. If, if I don't forgive these people, if I don't forgive these people, then, then, then what power am I allowing this, this gospel to have in my heart and in my mind and in my life? What am I, what am I doing here? What, 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 what does any of this mean? And so he broken, he, he washes his, gets up, washes his face of the tears, and he, and he goes the next morning and he tells this crowd of pastors what he'd been wrestling with the night before. And it becomes this beautiful moment of forgiveness, of reconciliation, of restoration. One of, one of the guys... Uh, ends up, who, who was involved in murdering his family members, ends up working for him. Another guy who was actually the son of the guy who killed his father ends up living in his house for quite a while. It's just, it is amazing. He's, he's recently had the president of Burundi knocking on his door, inviting him to come and, and, uh, and, and work in, in Burundi. They're just seeing the work they're doing in the, in the countries that they're working in. And, and I think the most intriguing uh, in, invitation he's had lately uh, is from imams, from Muslim clerics who, who, are, who have seen the work he's doing of restoration and reconciliation. They're saying, hey, will you come to our town, to our village? And he said, well, you, you understand I'm going to be speaking from the Injil, from the New Testament. Yeah, 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 we know that. You understand I'm coming with this gospel thing and we're talking about Jesus. Yeah, yeah, we, we don't care. Whatever it is you've got, we need. And, and so he's going there. And, he, and he's bringing that message of restoration, of reconciliation, of, of forgiveness. Peter's language is foreign, but maybe not because it's Stone Age or primitive or backward. It's foreign because who wants to bear the brunt of what someone else has done? Who wants to substitute themselves for someone else? It's foreign, and the trouble is if we buy into this very foreign idea, the implication is that we might have to start living like that as well, like foreigners. Who wants to do that? I'm going to wrap up here in a moment, but um, you know, if, if, if all we talked about was death and dying and substitution and, and all of that, this would be a little bit depressing, right? But that's not all that, that's not all that Peter says. That's not the whole, that's not everything. He also says this. He says, through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Raise, he starts talking about this raising Jesus from the dead. Again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to believe this stuff. I just want to make sure you get the narrative whole, right? Uh, and, and so he's talking about this resurrection, and so often the resurrection has been reduced to, to almost nothing. It's just reduced to this, oh, this rubber stamp that, okay, good, death's not the end. Okay, good, Jesus raised from the dead, so there's, there's something else after we die. Great. But it's not just, it's not just that. It's, it's much more than that. It's richer than that. See, see the resurrection, you, we must start seeing the resurrection as a promise, a promise that God makes, a promise that, ju that just as God has reversed the effects of death, reversed the raised Jesus from the dead, redeemed his life from the pit, just as he has reversed the effects of injustice, of evil, of, of death in Jesus. That, that's what he's done in resurrection, reversing the, what we thought could not be reversed, reverses the effects of death and injustice and evil in Jesus. So too, he says, I want to do this for you, and I want to do this for my creation.
So, so yes, there is this death, there's this dying, there's a bearing the brunt, there's this substituting ourselves, but, but it's all in the context of this God who promises to reverse the effects of death and injustice, of evil, who promises to set this world to rights. Okay, so I'm, I'm wrapping up here with, uh, make it by making a retraction. <laughs> Something I said last week, I have to withdraw. That's never good when your pastor has to do that, right? But uh, I'm, I'm, go I'm gonna do that. I have to withdraw something I said last week. Last week I said that holiness is not part of the public discourse. <laughs> I said it's just not part of public life. It's not part of real life. So it's, this is why we never see it on the front page of the New York Times. Next to that story about corruption and scandal, there was not another story next to that about holiness, right? This is, this is what I said. And that's actually what I have to retract. I have to withdraw that because it's not true. Sometimes, every now and then, not very often, but every now and then there's a story about holiness on the front page of the New York Times, plastered on the headline. It happened a few weeks ago. When those people in Charleston were shot, brutally murdered, shot to death, the very next day, on the front page of the New York Times, it says the family's message, the victim's family's message is, we forgive you. We forgive you. What's that if that is not a story about holiness, lives pointing to God, lives facing in the right direction? Right. What, if that, what is that? That's not a story about holiness. Sometimes when you're holy, that's what it's like. You, you just look different. Sometimes when you're holy, it, 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 it's, that's what it's like. It's like you're living by the laws of another land, by the conventions and customs of some place else. Some, sometimes, sometimes when you're holy, it's as if you're speaking another language, and, you, and you've got this very strange grammar that betrays every time an entirely different way of seeing the world. Uh, and I don't know about you, but, but for me, um, that, that's a very different kind of different. But it is a different that I very desperately want to be. Let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, there's no doubt that you, you, you call us to be different and foreign and aliens and strangers, all those words that perhaps many of us are not even comfortable with, holy, not just different for different sake, but to, to take our lives and, and point them in your direction. So Father, we pray that you would help us to look different, so different we couldn't hide it if we tried. Help us to live by those customs and conventions of the gospel. Help us to learn this language, this strange grammar that will betray every time a radically different way of seeing. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.